glad to be here with you and with all of you. Um, so I want to talk about our work, uh, but I want to back up before I start talking about breeding corn for nitrogen fixation, which is the main theme of what I want to talk about. We'll talk a little bit about nitrogen in general and corn in general. Um, a lot of this, the stuff I, I want to talk about um, comes from my own work um, at the Mondaman Institute. Let's see if we can get this thing to work. There we go. Um, Mondaman means corn in Ojibwe, uh, and uh, because we use a lot of native corn in our breeding to get quality back into the corn and some of the traits that we need for sustainable farming, it makes sense to, to use that word. And uh, we're located in southeastern Wisconsin. Now, some of the things I want to talk about, I want to talk about soil first. And you've heard a lot about soil. And, but I'm, I'm hoping I can sort of put it together for you from the perspective of corn. <clears throat> we, we've talked about quality, uh, soil quality, structure, and so on. I want to talk about root health, because that's a big issue, particularly when it comes to microbial relationships with corn and how well it can do in terms of getting its nitrogen. Um, I want to talk about organic matter uh, <coughs> quality. And I want to talk about um, also stimulants. We've, we've heard a lot of uh, talk about microbial stimulants. We've done some research in particular with biodynamic uh, preparations to see what kind of effect they had. And in terms of, of yields and, and profitability, uh, we, we've done some, some longer term research on that. And then we're going to talk about fusarium. I, I assume all of you know what fusarium is. It's a fungus. And it's, um, it's an important um, factor in Midwestern agriculture, uh, not only in terms of soil biology and plant health and nitrogen, but also in terms of end product, in terms of, of mycotoxins. <coughs> Um, so let's start out with the soil, and there's two pictures here, and the one on the right you see is, these are side-by-side, medium-textured soil in southeastern Wisconsin. The one on the right, we just turned under sweet clover. Uh, it had been under-seeded in oats, and it's, uh, you can see that beautiful soil structure there. On the left, we had grown corn after sweet clover the previous year. And um, what do you see? What's the difference between those two soils? Well, I, yeah, yeah, there are some roots here, and uh, from the from the corn from the previous year here, can you see? I don't know how you can see that this is almost kind of massive. What we call massive structure. It's like a brick. And um, over here, can you see all these fine crumbs in the soil? What, uh, <coughs> Would you call them, uh, Dean, uh, you've got another word for them, I call them crumbs, aggregates, aggregates peds, and you had one other term for, for them. But coffee grounds? That's yeah, what Gary grounds, called yeah. <laughs> so, the, so basically, with soil building, you can see what corn has done. We built up the soil by using a cover crop, and the corn took that, the starch out of the soil. The corn destroyed the soil quality. And it produced a lot of corn. And I, I want you to be thinking that, that corn actually is a soil eater. <laughs> it is. It gives us a lot, but it takes a lot to grow it. And um, if, you, if you've seen where corn has been grown after corn a lot, you'll probably see a lot of soils that are pretty darn hard. And it has to do with the roots. It has to do with the soil, what happens to the soil aggregates. The aggregates disappear. And um, I want to talk a little bit about that aggregation process was beautifully gone into a little earlier on. Here you can see um, a another medium textured soil. Uh, this is a McHenry. The other one was a Fox Silbone. And you can see it's under vetch. And doggone, I wish I, this thing was huge. I wish this picture was huge so you could just begin to kind of, oops. This, how does this point work? Uh, ah, here we go. Yeah. There we go. Um, yeah, we have to. Oh, does it? Yeah, okay, cool. <coughs> Can you see all these little little grains in here in the soil? Get this focus. All the tiny little little um, 
little crumbs. Well, they get under the vetch. The vetch is a kind of a magician. And under the vetch, it, it, it builds the soil. All those tiny little crumbs start, start getting stuck together by what's coming out of those vetch roots. And it's, it, it's, you get this, this, this rounded form. So having, if you take a, a big mass of soil and you break it, you'll see all these sharp edges, right? You know, it's kind of like jagged edges. If it's a, if it's a bad, heavy soil, and you crumble it, bam, it comes into pieces, like jagged pieces. But what the vetch is doing is it's sticking all these little little um, soil particles together into rounded crumbs. And earthworms will do this too. And, and, and the, the legumes will do this, this kind of rounding and, and making of soil. You know, the soil is made, it's put together. And there's a guy out in, in Michigan, a professor, who studied this process, and what he discovered was in all these little crumbs, and these things are about a hundredth of an inch in size to about, um, you know, a, a third of an inch in size. These little crumbs, they build up a kind of a skin that's, that's got proteinaceous substances in it. So these little aggregates, they, they're kind of a, a skin around them of this young organic matter decomposing good, fast stuff. And that's wonderful. You, so that's what makes these crumbs in your soil, is this young organic matter. And it's, it's, these crumbs are actually, it's building like little skins around these things. You can think of it in that way of young uh, mineral organic complexes that, that sticks things together. And, there's, they're, they're, and, and they form along roots. You'll see these little aggregates forming along dying roots, like little pearls. So, um, <clears throat> So here you see it with the vetch, and yet if you grow corn after that, all that will disappear. The corn will get it, but that's part of the process of growing corn without nitrogen in terms of fertilizer, <coughs> is that you've, you've made the soil and with all that young proteinaceous substance in it, and then the corn takes it out of the soil. That's a little bit of the secret of growing, of growing corn uh, without a lot of nitrogen, is that you've got soil quality that you've, you've built into the soil. And I, I'll show you here, it's an experiment we did. It was a six-year experiment in southeastern uh, Wisconsin. We had conventional corn and beans, and then we had, uh, and we didn't use any pesticides in that. It wasn't real conventional because we didn't use any herbicides or, or fungicides. And then we had organic and biodynamic. And when you looked at the real blocky stuff, the stuff that was uh, greater than eight millimeters in size, that's uh, over a third of an inch in size, the conventional, system had a lot of the blocky stuff. And it had very little of the, the stuff that you want to build in the soil, the stuff that's between a hundredth of an inch in size and a third of an inch in size of just the, the crumbs. So you guys can read your soils. You can read the life quality in your soils is going to be important for you to be growing crops with less nitrogen by looking at the soil structure. But the important thing that you got to know with this is that read your soils, look at the crumbs in the spring, but you got to know that it's a dynamic process. And when, if we go back, so we can go back to this thing, this, under the influence of corn, by the fall comes around, will look like this. Okay? So basically what we have is a dynamic process that the soils degrade. And then they get built back up, and in the, in the, in the winter, if the soil's been fed, or had some manuring or, or so in the fall, you'll see that in the spring, the crumb structure is great, the quality is back in that soil. So it's a kind of a, of a breathing process of the earth that we're also involved in here. And so this living, so this is part of the nitrogen process, the nitrogen dynamic that we can feed or not feed. And, and so I, I wanted you to, to try to try to get a, understand that. When the soils get bad, when they get blocky, when they get miserable, um, then this then we get diseases in the roots. And in particular, in the Midwest, we get a lot of fusarium. And there's we're going to talk a lot about fusarium. There's different species of fusarium. <coughs> the fusarium that lives on the on the roots and causes root rots is encouraged by poor soil conditions. And so this, we did a survey from 2000, 2002 in three different states, in Wisconsin, in Northern Illinois, and in Iowa. 
and we, we had conventional farmers, we had organic farmers, uh, quite a few of them. We had strip plots with and without their fertilizer, and we did nitrogen budgets on their, on their, and, and yield trials on their farms to see whether, you know, where are these people at? And what we discovered when we looked at the roots and we dug all the roots when the plants were flowering, we went out and did that, uh, was we discovered that the conventional roots had a lot more root rot in general than the organic. But that the organic differed. There were some organic farmers that had a, a, quite a bit of root rot and some that did had, were totally clean. And so the way the farmers were managing really made a difference. And in, in general, if we looked at the conventional and the organic, this was a percent of root rot that we saw in terms of necrotic roots. Uh, it was almost double for the conventional, but it was really bad where corn followed after corn. That's when the root rot was really bad. And um, if, we, if we looked at that, we did all the survey and looked at these farms for two years. There was this one farm, the Zinnaker farm, which had been um, actually biodynamic, and it had been biodynamic <coughs> since the 1940s, and they'd used crop rotations and, and, um, and uh, manures. They composted their manure. They used uh, biodynamic preparations, which are kind of biostimulants. They had totally healthy roots. We, never saw, we didn't see it on any of the other farms. In fact, at the stage of anthesis, when the plants were flowering, the seminal rooting system, the very first one that came out of the seed, was still alive. And we didn't see that on any other farms. There, were, there was really no disease on these roots. Um, so that, of course, uh, we started doing, we, we were doing research on this to find out what's going on here. We looked at roots. Um, I did some trials before I came to Wisconsin in Washington State, and then we did trials in Wisconsin. And we looked at these um, organic, compared organic, conventional, and biodynamic, and we had a, the six-year rotation for the organic and the biodynamic. The only difference was using these, these uh, biostimulants. Um, and what we found was that, the, as has been noted with the SB2 or, um, product, that we got a stimulation of root growth with the biodynamic, and, and also the health and the vegetative growth. Uh, where we use these biostimulants, and that did yield, lead to a, uh, a yield balancing effect, so that when we had bad years, we actually got more yield, uh, in terms of just general bad yield years. And we found that with both winter wheat and with corn. And the thing was is that on the really good years, we didn't get more yield. Um, and we, we attributed that to the better rooting system. The plants were, were being stimulated to put more into roots. And they didn't need those roots on the super good years, but they need, and then they would be putting that yield you know, into something else. But in the bad years, having a really good, healthy rooting system made a big difference. And so with climatic instability that we're facing, where, the, where things just come crashing into us, it does make sense to me to be shifting our efforts towards, towards having really healthy rooting systems and having strong rooting systems and, and, and biostimulants that actually help the roots to grow and be able to take the stresses that come our way. That may not be always, you may not always get the big return on the big years, but on the bad years, I think that's really going to count. And so um, if we looked at Across the board, if we looked at the, um, the wheat, uh, it was $113 more an acre over six years of trials, um, and more income. And well, we used an open pollinated corn because we wanted to keep back our seed and see how the systems did it. But it was only $73 more for the uh, corn. But I think that would have been higher if we used a hybrid. Uh, and that's the kind of yield response that we're getting. This is the effect of using the preparations, those, those uh, biostimulants. And as the yield of the wheat went up, um, the effect would go down. So it was really, really on the, on the, on the bad years that we were seeing the, the benefits. And here you can see um, root growth, root length. And uh, here we have uh, three different systems. We have bi uh, organic, biodynamic, and biodynamic plus, where we've done extra spray. And here you can see the root length 
and the root weight, so we actually have some numbers on, on for two different years on how these things actually do affect root growth. Now, on the fusaria, you know, I mentioned this, and conventional farming systems do have, <coughs> tend to have more fusarium problems, and um, probably Roundup is a factor in that. Uh, Roundup tends to encourage uh, fusarium problems, and uh, more about that later. Um, convent also, conventional corn has been bred to favor fusarium as an endophyte. You remember that term, endophyte? The, the, bat, the, the microbes that grow inside the plant? Well, fusarium, um, we have inadvertently selected corn for fusarium as a dominant endophyte in the plant. And that has some benefits, and it has some negative things. Why did we do that? Well, we selected, we didn't do it on purpose. We corn breeders selected for first generation corn borer resistance, and that tended to select for plants that had a lot of, had a lot of, of fusarium in them. Um, also, we selected for plants that don't tiller, that don't branch out at the base, that have short and small tassels. That also uh, tended to select for fusarium, because fusarium is influencing the plant to do that. We selected for stronger <coughs> stalks. Also, fusarium makes the plants have, have stronger stalks. So, um, so all these things uh, tended to benefit fusarium in the plant as a dominant endophyte. So if you're a corn breeder and you want to breed corn that stands well and, and does everything you want, you have to do it in a way that doesn't favor the fusarium. And that's, that's our challenge. Um, so, um, there are some bad things about fusarium. Fusarium, for one thing, it, it induces nitrogen deficiency in the plants. So plants, when they have fusarium problems, they get nitrogen deficient. It's a physiological effect, and, um, and so they just don't, aren't just nitrogen deficient. And also they, they um, have a negative effect on all the good microbes that live in the plant, um, so that they produce fusaric acid, they're very dominating, the, the bacteria that can fix nitrogen, many of them are reduced by fusarium and also um, other fungi. So there is a, it's a pretty strong dominant uh, endophyte. Oh, and also um, it induces, um, okay, so fusarium also under the wrong conditions produces a lot of toxins. I assume that you guys know about fusarium, that you've had grain crops that where things were wet, and you, or, or you had a, had a drought, or you had other problems with uh, with, uh, with stock rot, and, and you had uh, the fusarium in the grain, and you couldn't feed this stuff to your animals, or you had to dilute it, or you couldn't sell it. How many of you have had know about fusarium? Raise your hand if you know about fusarium. You know, you, you probably experience its bad effects. It's extremely, it produces uh, mycotoxins that are extremely toxic. They're not good for, for animals, they're not good for people. They, um, they have lots of, of effects. Uh, they, they can cause cancer, birth defects. They can suppress the immune system. They can alter the nervous system and the functioning of the brain. Um, and they're not just not good things to have around in the food system or the feed system. So what does all this mean? If we want to be breeding corn that comes into a different relationship with microbial partners, what it means is that we have to, first off, we have to be looking towards healthy systems where fusarium doesn't thrive. That means we need to be getting probably away from Roundup and we need to be getting away, and we need to be building soil structure um, and have healthy rooting systems. Um, also, we need to be selecting plants that thrive and can, and can do the nitrogen efficiency thing uh, because they're not fostering fusarium inside themselves. Um, what's been discovered in all the research that's been done, and there's, I got a, a paper up on my website on this, reviewing all the research that's been done on nitrogen fixing corn, there's been quite a bit that's been done, is that what people find in general is, yeah, some corn can do it, but a lot of corn can't. And um, it's very variety specific. And we're gonna hone in a little bit on that, but basically what you have to have in order for it to work 
is a partnership that develops between the plant and the, and the microbes. And there has to be kind of a meshing of their, uh, the, of their metabolisms between the two things. And it's a kind of an intimate adaptation process where the plants and the, and the, and the um, bacteria co-evolve to be able to do these functions. And so um, this, uh, this is a process that has to be fostered. And if you're putting a lot of fertilizer on the plants, you won't see it. So basically, <coughs> when we do this breeding, we actually have to breed under conditions where we don't fertilize and see who can really, who, who can really do it. Um, the plant, when it's nitrogen stressed, it shifts its metabolism in the direction of trying to foster these beneficial bacteria that can fix the nitrogen. It reduces the amount of ethylene in its tissues, which is a, a natural uh, antimicrobial. And um, it, it reduces other compounds that it makes that would, would inhibit bacterial growth. It may produce a renchema. And I'm gonna, in a moment, I'll show you what a renchema are. The plant actually bores out its root it makes tubes in its root in order to, and, and inside those tubes, nitrogen-fixing bacteria can live. Um, and it, um, it also, there's very specific um, races of corn that have evolved to be able to fix <coughs> nitrogen from Mexico. And these races of corn actually exude uh, a mucigel on the on their roots, on the uh, on the ends of their of, of their roots, and this mucigel will harvest almost pure cultures of nitrogen fixing bacteria. And and it's been recently shown, and this has recently been shown by others besides ourselves. So anyway, here you can see what a root looks like, a cross section of a root that makes these arenchima. You can see. It actually uses hydrogen peroxide to bore out in a beautiful way. It's a real sculpturing event to make these arenchima. And this is a normal root, and here's one that makes a lot of arenchima. Not all, all corn does that. And here you can see nitrogen-fixing bacteria, um, these little stars show inside these arenchima that will fix, fix, uh, fix nitrogen. Now, this shows... Um, one of the Mexican corns that we've been working with uh, to do our breeding. And um, you can see here that what we noticed when we were, were selecting. Um, can you see that little blackened tip there? Can you see the mucigel around it? Can you see that like sort of slimy covering on the outside of the root? Yeah? I assume you can. Of course, you didn't say, yes, we see it. <laughs> but anyway, I, I assume you see it. Well, um, what's going on here is that the roots have a kind of a maturation process. Can you see how blackened these guys are at the tips? <coughs> yeah? OK. So what's going on is that these roots are secreting this up. These are younger roots than these, because they were formed later. Um, and what's going on is they'll, they'll do this. And then they, they ne necroticize the tip of the root. It looks, uh, if you look at these things, they almost look like cigarette butts. And we think it's a, it's a kind of an autolysis, a kind of a self-digestion of the, of the cultures that are living on the surfaces of those roots in order to be able to harvest the nitrogen that's been grown there. <coughs> Here you can see that, that same race, Michenio, and, and uh, this was our initial cross, and as we've, we've um, gone into breeding inbreds from it, because you make uh, hybrids from inbreds, um, how we've, um, we've uh, tried to preserve that trait in the corn as we moved along that breeding. Uh, here you can see University of Wisconsin and, and UC Davis have recently published a study on that land race, the Michenio land race, showing that it can, it can fix uh, very large quantities I, I believe it was up to, to um, two-thirds, uh, excuse me, three-fourths three of the nitrogen in the plant up to that level um, using that on that mucigel, probably, mostly. Now, I will talk a little bit about the process that we have gone through and the kind of results. One thing is, is nitrogen efficiency, but what, what good does that do us? 
Um, there have been some things that we have found. Um, the, um, one of the things that happened when we started breeding our corn under conditions where we didn't fertilize was all of a sudden uh, we started seeing kernel quality shifts. And we had a lot of mutations that were popping out in our populations. And we've done quite a bit of study on the, on the quality of the grain that came from that, together with Abdullah Jaradat from, from Morris, from the USDA station up in Morris. And uh, what we found was that these, these opaque, or these soft kernels that were popping out, you can see them here, versus these, these harder, harder endosperm uh, corns, that these opaque kernels were associated with much better kernel quality in terms of their nutritional value. Not only were they more digestible, but also they had better quality protein. And the frequency that we found in some of these populations of, of, of mutation or of shift in the, in the proportions from one generation to the other after several years of this kind of stress was very high. So it seemed like there was a kind of a jump going on, a kind of a, of a um, emergence of traits that so we suggest that this is not what we call genetic evolution, but what we call ep epigenetic evolution. That patterns are shifting of expression of the genes in the plant yeah, under the conditions where there's not very much nitrogen in the soil or not very much available nitrogen. When we studied, when we made hybrids from our inbreds and we studied them versus conventional inbreds, uh, we found that we, we had higher protein but the protein quality was much higher. In particular, we had a lot more methionine than we did in conventional. And that's, of course, very important for any of you who have poultry or sell your corn, and I think about more than half of the corn that gets sold, on organic corn that gets sold, probably goes to feed organic poultry. And methionine is uh, the major limiting amino acid for organic poultry production. So people are having to feed things like sunflower meal or uh, soybean meal to get enough methionine for their organic birds. And basically, we we strongly increase the methionine by selecting under these conditions. Also, the lysine has gone up um, from the from the conventional as well. A 14 percent difference here. 51. This is wet chemistry analysis. It costs us about 85 dollars a sample. But we developed a near infrared. Uh, method that costs us about five dollars a sample to do the analysis and here you can see from 2011 to 2016 we analyzed 149 conventional hybrids and 1250 of ours and, and that was in terms of, of test plot research with side-by-side -side comparisons and uh, you can see that with that research we're about 30 percent higher um, in methionine than for the conventional corn now that has a value that, um, that, that increases the value of the corn uh, by about $1.37 a bushel. Just for the methionine, not to talk about digestibility, not to talk about carotene or anything. Here, here we look at the trials that we had, 120 of our cultivars versus um, 12 conventional. And um, if we look, at, and here was 90 of ours versus seven conventional hybrids, 78 of ours, six conventional um, proteins are, were 16% were high, 17% uh, higher, 15%, 25% higher than the conventional. Oil was 20% higher, 13%, 11%. Lysine, 20%, 19%, 20%. And methionine, 24, 25, and 36% higher. So, hey, that's a lot of data. You know, this stuff actually does that. And um, it does it routinely. And um, so, so yeah, um, we also have tried just by selection to increase the methionine content in the grain, I mean, not methionine, the carotene content in the grain. And that's particularly because we want to get egg yolks like that. That jacks up the value of a, of a, of a dozen eggs. Um, I just was in Milwaukee last week, not last weekend, but the weekend before. My wife and I bought some high quality eggs ten dollars a dozen okay they were really orange <laughs> okay they were really orange and i've been in, in los angeles um, and i talked with poultry companies out there on the west coast and yeah i mean basically people want orange yolks orange yolks means quality to people they can see it 
And so, um, so we've, we've been selecting for that, and boy, do we get some orange eggs, I'll tell you. My wife and I, we're just like, okay, you know, sometimes it's kind of, it's hard to do what we're doing. Breeding corn, small, small business, hey, we work with some really good professionals and so on, but it's not easy to breed a new corn that has a quality, not just quantity, but quality on it. But when my wife and I sit down at breakfast and open up those eggs, we know we got something. You know, we just have to find out how to how to make make a living from 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 it in, in a good way. So that's that's um, that's what we're doing. And uh, well, we should say that we're we're you know some of these eggs that we we were raising, you know, they they're so orange that you know they go past the color charts that people use to to judge egg color. They just do. So uh, now, I want to sh shift a little bit and talk about um, inbreds. Okay, so inbreds, if you, how many, are there any of you who grow um, hybrid seed? Besides Steve out there, is it Albert Lee's here too, right? You, you guys grow inbreds? And you know that organic, or growing inbreds under organic conditions, at least from what I've heard, maybe you can say the same thing, you gotta get the right inbreds because often, they do not do well under organic conditions. And so we started to, to study that, and um, we, here's, we had some, some inbreds from a company, and this is what we call culture shock. When you bring them from a conventional system where you're not using a lot of fertilizer, and you bring them into an organic system, they often, particularly if you don't really fertilize heavy, they, uh, they don't do so well. And they look like they're low in nitrogen, they're deficient, and they don't compete well with weeds. And, um, and here you can see on a nitrogen deficient year, wow, they really look bad. And um, we took eight different breeding lines that we had kept under or, and grown them under organic biodynamic conditions for years, and we compared them with the original inbreds. And um, here you can see um, what we had been selecting under our conditions and what the original stock was like, and um, here it is again. This is ours, and there's there's the original stock. So we have been selecting, uh, growing them under our conditions, keeping back our own seeds, selecting them for <coughs> under our conditions, conditions, even inbreds, which are supposed to be genetically fixed and not changed. You're sort of like a, a unit, <laughs> you know, something people patent. They think of them as a thing, but they continue to evolve. And, um, and so uh, we found 16, uh, across those eight, we found 16% more um, higher chl chlorophyll scores in the ones that we had kept across the board than for the ones that had been grown under conventional. And chlorophyll and nitrogen go hand in hand, so if you've got 16% more chlorophyll, you'll probably have 16% more nitrogen in the, in the plants. So, now, one of the things that's going on when we look at our rooting systems under low nitrogen conditions, I'm not talking about under high nitrogen conditions, this would be totally different, but when nitrogen is deficient and we grow ours here and we grow theirs there, you can see a very different rooting system. The, the conventional inbreds are going steep and deep. <coughs> they're, they're, they're really going down like this. And if you look at them, they look like that at the top too. You know, they're very upright, they're very tight, they're, they're built for being packed into, into, space, into narrow spaces, and they're going down to get the nitrate, which is leaching down there, right? Makes sense, doesn't it? That's what they've been bred for. Whereas ours, when we're breeding them under organic conditions without much nitrogen, they're spreading. They're making these umbrellas going out, and they're encompassing a larger area of soil. Okay, so if you look at the root ball, it's a much bigger root ball. And you look at it from underneath, you can see, wow, this is encompassing a lot more soil than the other ones that are just going down. Well, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Like, you're gonna, yeah? Uh, when you say conventional, are those uh, just non-GMO or LH-GMO? Uh, these are non-GMO, LH-206 and LH-123 were built, were bred by Holden's company. Um, S7 and S5, I can't tell you where they came from, but they're, they're modern commercial inbreds that um, people in seed companies use. Uh, they're good ones that are used for under organic conditions because they do well under organic. And uh, they're, they're current. 
and these are ours and um, these are nitrogen efficient varieties that we've bred uh, under low nitrogen conditions and they, they do well under organic conditions relatively speaking. Uh, now, in terms of the nitrogen fixation, uh, we, we were shocked, and I was shocked in 2009. We grew a bunch of land races of corn, and our, our corn and conventional inbreds from a company, all side by side. And um, we inoculated everything with a nitrogen fixing bacterium. And we, um, it was a nitrogen deficient site, and wow! There was huge differences. The conventional inbreds all showed um, culture shock. They all looked like they were deficient in nitrogen. They had low, um, they had low um, chlorophyll scores. They averaged 37, whereas these land races averaged 54. I mean, that's a big difference in terms of this is this is nitrogen sufficient, and this is definitely nitrogen deficient. And if we looked at the, um, at the, we looked at the isotopes in the plants, um, and there's a, a ratio between the N natural isotopes, the N15 and the N14. And if it shifts in the direction of, and there's more N14 than N, the balance is shifted in the air. There's more N14 and less N15. So you can measure how much has come from the air by looking at the balance of these isotopes. And when we did that, we found and estimate how much nitrogen's come from the air. And when we did that, we found that for some of these land races, up to half of the nitrogen had come from the air, or possibly had come from the air. It wasn't because they were making a lot of roots. It wasn't like pillage down in the soil uh, with rooting systems, because they didn't have big rooting systems. And that got us into, well, of course, that was very exciting. And, and you can see here's B73, which is a conventional inbred, uh, which is almost in every hybrid grown in the Midwest. And um, it just looked nitrogen deficient all season long, whereas right next to it, we had these extremely dark green plants with very high scores. We took those, we took those, um, how are we doing for time? Uh, we, we took those varieties and we, we inoculated or didn't inoculate them with nitrogen-fixing bacteria, or we made hybrids with, with the, those, those land races that looked good. We grew them with and without inoculate, and we grew conventional um, hybrids uh, from the different companies, four of them, and four of our new hybrids. And um, <coughs> what we found was we, we had, a, and this was the response to the bacteria, you can see for our varieties, they really responded to nitrogen bacteria, nitrogen fixing bacteria, but not the conventional. The protein yield when we inoculated went way up, and the yield of essential amino acids went way up. So basically, um, these varieties were really responding to nitrogen fixing bacteria by making more protein. And if we looked at, at the grain yield going this way, and the protein yield going this way, and these are these new experimental hybrids, and these are the conventional hybrids that you guys at that time probably were going to. You could see that for every uh, every um, unit of, of, of yield, we were getting more protein from these these um, these uh, experimental hybrids, and that's what we started breeding with those those things, and uh, we first we did crazy things. We grew them in a quarry an old quarry soil to see, well, how far can we push this? And, you know, a cold quarry soil is not really that much soil. It's what they call an insectosol. It's just beginning to be a soil. And, uh, and you know, basically almost everything crashed, but we had a few varieties that made it all the way to flower. It didn't get anything that made seed, but we had a very heat and drought conditions. But those ones that made it to flower those were the ones that then we continued to use. They had practically no nitrogen in that soil. And then we also grew them in the very sandy soils. It's really nice to have, I know it's hard for a farmer to make a living on a poor sandy soil, but for, from the standpoint of selection, it's great. Um, so we had a soil that had 1% organic matter, but was well stocked in P and K, and um, we grew, um, bunch of these elite lines that we were, were breeding. 
Um, and um, we, when we looked at it, we had a normal corn belt, uh, normal corn belt um, populations that we compared them with. And what we found was that the conventional normal populations went barren. They didn't form ears when there wasn't enough nitrogen. Whereas some of these, these elite uh, breeding lines could form ears and produce something and, and um, under those conditions. So here you can see the conventional. And this you can see the best line, which then became our most, most used uh, line, the, the, the C line. And here, um, here is where, in 2015, we were able to fix an inbred from it, or an inbred family from it, which really was like super dark and grown wherever we grew it. It was just like, wow, these leaves are black green. They're loaded with chlorophyll, and they were also loaded with nitrogen in the leaves. Here you can see it versus its sister lines. It was this one here that really was doing it. There's a lot of selection pressure that's put on it to be able to get to that level. Here you can see it in the field um, versus um, related neighbors over here, but it's, it's doing it under the nitrogen deficient conditions. And here you can see it the next year, in 2016, these ones are doing it, these are related ones that aren't doing it. So, wow. Um, when we took these hybrids and we looked at them, we looked at them in 2016, we looked at them um, on three different sites. We had a low fertility site, uh, two low fertility sites where we used a small amount of chicken manure and um, we had a, a very heavily manured site, that biodynamic farm I was telling you about, which had been heavily manured and had great soil fertility. And uh, on those sites, you know, this. We got, we got an earlier planting on this one than we did on these, just simply because we're bringing seed back from different places and it just took us time to get it all together. But on these sites, which were planted in June, uh, you could really see that there was an effect of, of these, these, new, these new hybrids, that they did really well under the low nitrogen conditions. Uh, whereas the, on the conventional site, or not conventional, on the heavily manured organic biodynamic site, we didn't really see much difference in the yield. So the point was is, hey, you know what? We're breeding, we're not breeding racehorses here, I'm sorry. We're breeding, um, we're breeding uh, working horses and they really can do something, but particularly under the conditions when we say we're bred, under where there isn't really, where nitrogen is more limited. We see the differences here. You can see this is, uh, this is that, that sea corn I was telling you about versus the inbred, it was bred by crossing that Mexican corn twice with a corn belt dent inbred, this inbred here. And you can see the color difference here. Um, and we're talking about chlorophyll scores uh, when we compare the conventional inbreds with our inbreds, uh, we're talking about generally somewhere between 15% and 31% and um, more or more um, chlorophyll, higher chlorophyll scores just in the inbreds. <coughs> so they, they look like they're, they're more nitrogen efficient when they grow. When we grew the hybrids this year, um, here you can see um, hybrids that we thought were our best nitrogen uh, efficient line. This is on a, on a manure site with chicken manure um, where nitrogen wasn't a problem. And uh, this is our check. Um, um, this is uh, uh, FOSS 8507, a really good hybrid from Steve's, Steve's uh, company. And you can see the chlorophyll, um, <coughs> chlorophyll scores are, are higher than for the FOSS. And that was the case over uh, five different farms, or six different farms. Um, however, for that one particular hybrid, it, uh, it was bred from the sea. So the sea it was sea crossed with sea, and it had more susceptibility to uh, gray leaf spot this year. We were talking about things crashing in the fall for a lot of varieties. Well, this one crashed, and the FOSS 8507 did not. And so it out yielded uh, this variety because of disease resistance. But we do have varieties that seem to have the disease resistance, and they produce much more similar yields. Here you can see um, where we got really clean leaves, even, even um, we didn't have, seem to have problems with tar spot on those which was nice because tar spots seem to be a real issue this year for us. Um, 
we would just go over here. Overall yields uh, with our best hybrid 17 by C2 B2, um, which which uh, I'm working with Steve on. We're trying to get this, this stuff out. We're working with a bunch of farmers. We have strip trials uh, in, in, in uh, four different states now with farmers. And uh, we had on 13 sites, um, 17 reps, in terms of bushels per acre, it actually did out yield the checks on average, but with a really good check, like the FOSS 8507, well, we were going behind it, we didn't do as well. But still, we were at 175 bushel an acre. That's a high methionine corn with high carotene content. Maybe it's worth a dollar thirty-seven more a bushel just for the methionine. I don't know about the carotene, what that's going to put it. So I think there's some potential here for getting something that's going to have quality and yield. And that's the point. We actually want to have something that has better value. It'll have better value not only if you sell the grain, but also if you feed it to your animals. And, um, and that's, that's kind of what we, we want to do. You know? um, we also have an inoculant that we developed, a nitrogen-fixing bacteria inoculate with, um, with several different bacteria in it. Uh, target the endophytes in the plant, also on the roots, um, of in, the, in, the, in, the, in the soil. And we did see uh, across the board for the FOSS 8507, 10 bushel more where we didn't fertilize, and 10 bushel an acre more where we did fertilize for the FOSS 8507. So, but for the nitrogen fixing corn, it no longer seemed to respond at all to the, to the inoculation. And I think that's because it's carrying the bacteria in it. I want to say, uh, on these endophytes, the plant can carry endophytes like the fusarium from seed to seed, from, from seed to plant to seed. So they carry them along, the, the culture that they have. Uh, not all the bacteria or not all the fungi, but some of them they will carry with them. And I suspect that's what's happening here, that we actually have built up these endophytes in the plant and these nitrogen-fixing varieties we're developing may not need to be inoculated anymore. But for conventional hybrids, this inoculate might be really interesting. Okay, so um, here's my question for you, for you all. And this is something that interests me very much. We're at, sort of at the research stage with this stuff. We're taking out the strip trials. And uh, I'm working with Steve. And we're just, we're interested in people, you know, who'd like to try it. Not necessarily in a strip trial, but just like to try the corn. And if you are interested in that, um, I've got a pad of paper um, here um, that would you, if you would be so kind either to talk to me or, or write your name down. We're working together with the University of Illinois. Um, we have a project with them and uh, a kind, we're setting up a kind of a, uh, of, a, of a collective group of farmers that are working together on this. So please, um, please do let me know if you'd like to be involved in that.